more foreplay. everybody and welcome back to part two of this review of Oxford United season. We said it was going to be a long video and we did not disappoint. We rambled on for ages in part one, which just pretty much went through the first part of the season, really, up until Christmas time, just after a sport of into January. You can check that out on the channel right now. You've got a link to it up, up in the top corner. So go and check that video out and then come back to this one and check out part two. But if you've already seen part one and you're ready to dive into part two we won't delay you much longer but i'm just going to say please can you hit like on this video because that helps me out so much and if you like the content think about subscribing i'm on the march to try and get as many subs as i can to try and get myself some money in my hands from this youtube channel robert i just i'm literally losing money hands over fist paying expensive guests like you to come onto this channel it's absolutely ridiculous there are timestamps down below, so you can jump to the little segments that we're talking about if you want to do so, or just sit around and watch the whole thing. Robert's back as well. It's amazing. He was only for, for you might you might be weeks apart watching this video, but for us, it's, it was it was seconds, seconds, Robert. Folks, if you thought the last video was a bit of a long one, don't worry. This video is going to be very quick because, frankly. Nothing really happened between January to the end of the season for Oxford United. As I recall, and my memory is normally very good on these matters, it was a pretty dull, lacklustre, quite unremarkable end of the season. Is that correct, Ian? Au contraire, Robert Allen. Au contraire. Strap yourselves in, sit down, get some snacks, because we've got plenty to talk about for this miserable, painful, awful second half of the season which nearly saw Oxford get relegated yay 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 but we're gonna start with some off the field uh news and stuff and info we're gonna start by talking about the stadium project it is section six stadium unity last year um it emerged that Oxford were planning on building a new stadium in Kidlington, which is where we are from and where you still live, even though you shouldn't really say that because people will be around trying to get autographs from you 24-7, <laughs> no doubt. Um, we know we know there's one fan that knows where you live. But Stratfield Break was the, the what Oxford were looking for. It was an all singing, all dancing, all bells and whistles, new stadium, ice rink, bowl plex, hotel. I think Firos Kassam was involved with it, wasn't he? If I know, wasn't, wasn't they going to get him to be the architect? We had an excellent track record on doing these things, so why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? But yes, it was it was apparent that the, the, the lease on the Kassam Stadium was going to end and Oxford needed to find a new stadium. And that is where they lined up. And obviously, not no sooner had they started talking about it, but you had this divide between the yay sayers and the nay sayers. And it did coincide with changes at board level for Oxford United this season. And there were, finally, there was talk about this takeover for a long, 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 long time. Um, people thinking what the heck is going on a lot of radio silence which never helps from a board and a football club but on the 27th of September it was announced that um, Eric Thorhea and Andrea Bakri became the major shareholders in Oxford United um, they're the previous owners still stayed around in more reduced roles but you had the likes of Grant Ferguson who was appointed director and you had the likes of Tim Williams and you had the likes of Niall McWilliams um, as well involved. Uh, Robert, um, good. I, I think that was nice to get some clarity finally when it did happen. Um, were, were you encouraged by what what you heard with, when this came out? It was way back in September. We, did, we did, I, just did, I wanted to sort of group all this stuff yeah. in together with the off the field um, what goings on. Well, it's nice to get the, the um, get some clarity on the situation because, like you say, you've been hearing rumours, stuff has sort of been going on, and then you know you don't hear anything, so suddenly people start trying to fill the vacuum. You know, a friend of a friend has heard that something's happened, type stories. But 
I think now what you could do is again like a new transfer. You just have to approach it and give these people the benefit of the doubt to see and you know see what they do. And we've had plenty of people come into the football club whilst we've been fans who have promised the earth, who have told us that they, you know, we're gonna go on a journey and all the rest of it. And it hasn't panned out like that. So really it's the easiest thing in the world to rock up and say, you know, this is gonna be amazing. Let's just see what they actually do once they um when it, with their decision making. That reminds me of one of my favourite songs, Robin Hood, Robin Hood, <laughs> riding through the glen. It became evident that um well, it became evident that Oxford would not be able to build that stadium in time at Stratfield break. It was just too much planning permission, too many hoops to jump through. So they, they changed tact and they looked at a new site, which was just over the road in a place that is called the Triangle, um, which is just literally divides kind of the A34, or the, the, the roads going out of Kidlington, if you like, just past the Kidlington roundabout near Sainsbury's. Here is, here is where it is on the map. Um, but that place has become known as the Triangle. But I could tell you, as uh, and Robert will back me up on this, as growing up in Kidlington, that place was always just known as, oh yeah, that random bit of land. Yeah, that bit of land that for once upon a time you could take bikes down there and then they grew some trees in there and frankly it's a bit of a waste you know there's nothing there you know it's nothing. just nothing no and it's not and this isn't anything that anyone had done it had been fashioned into like a dirt bike track yeah and then it was also known for having having your travelers like stay in yeah. there sometimes and that was it and also it had been land described as scrub and wasteland by um, the uh, the friends of Stratfield Break in the past too. So this seems this seems more feasible. This is where Oxford are still hanging their hat on. This is where it, they they've released plans recently of what it's going to look like. It's going to hopefully be a sixteen thousand capacity stadium with a focus on people not attending the game by car by attending using public transport links which is something quite frankly that the Kassam stadium is appalling at which would be a massive improvement and basically just hopefully bringing a lot of um job opportunities and sporting facilities into the kidlington area now if we go back to before this parish poll let's go back to january after that was arguably maybe the last well, maybe not the last, but that was a real, there was a real good, um, a real good showing of support and unity around the Oxford United fans around this kind of like this, this initial, I can't remember what it exactly was. It was initial kind of a, a point, a meeting with Oxfordshire County Council or City Council Oxford to get planning permission even started. Oxford United requested um, that loads of fans write to um, Oxford City Council, uh, Oxford County Council members, and uh, discuss the matters regarding the um, build. And they, you know, and we did. I mean, I think I wrote one. I'm, I'm, I'm I wrote one. Yeah, who do, doesn't even support football wrote one as well. A lot of people sent letters in, and there'd been a real good campaign from the club saying, if you want to help us, send an email. They were giving you the people to contact, they were telling you where to go. And, you know, there was a very, uh, it cleared the first hurdle that we need to clear comfortably. There are now several more hurdles that we obviously we do need to sort of get past. But at that point there, there was a good feel good factor over there. The club had asked for supporters' help. So the supporters had responded magnificently. Everyone was feeling good and positive about the situation. And then that was probably the last whoa, whoa, time. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down there. Slow down there, Tex. I'm going to assume that that feel-good factor and that that buoyancy that was bought by the Oxford United fans carried through onto the pitch. But we'll get to it in a second because we've got one more bit of business to talk about. And this is that parish poll, um, parish uh, council poll that was announced a few months ago. It took place in the last few weeks um, and it turned out it was... Uh, not so many people turned out to vote in it, did they? I'm sure you've got the facts and figures there. So if you want to run through it, Robert, you can. There were 3,000 ballot papers. Uh, 928 residents voted yes. 2,073 voted no, with five rejected. So an overwhelming number of people voting against the stadium. However, 
it's not to be on it. It's, it's hard to say because we very much in of like the little bubble of Oxford United fans who desperately want the stadium. And so it's sort of hard for us to get sort of um, in the mindset of people who don't want it, people who don't like football, people who sort of feel like people say, oh, that stadium's going to lower the property and the value of your house. That stadium's going to burn, bring some trouble to the village. That stadium's going to cause disruption. It's very easy to drop all those negative vibes onto people and suddenly, you know, it's quite easy to turn people against it. I mean, Oxford United fans tried to spin it as saying, literally only sort of like a small number of people in the entire village could be bothered to vote against it which i sort of feel is a bit most people though would have looked at that poll and just thought well we need more information coming out from oxford united about what they want to do before we really know yeah. before we really say yes or no on it so at the moment we are going to vote no because we don't know what the plans are and i think oxford have said they're going to release more plans and there has been some plans released but i think ultimately the decision is going to be made in september is that right yeah. something yeah. like so, that we made around about then and i don't think that really outside of kidlington there were too many people that really mat cared and i this is a horrible thing to say too many people that took much notice of this paris poll at all and things kind of really just carry on regardless yeah. of it really it was kind of it felt like a needless poll and a lot of people moaned about the studdedness of it and the fact that it cost a lot of money um to the parish council to put on um and 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 say and ultimately it just seemed a little bit unnecessary and it probably will prove to be but it is still it's something that it's slow progress and it's frustrating progress um and you just kind of want some clarity on it really in terms of where Oxford are going to be playing their football and you, you you kind of feel that this is it really isn't it there are no other alternatives it's got to be this triangle or Oxford are pretty screwed yeah that's the line that the club are certainly pushing and there was in them in their meetings they're saying it's this or nothing now whether that's just talk to try and push the thing through I don't know but you do sort of feel like saying now if this thing falls through where we'd start have to start from scratch somewhere else and then you're going to start running out of time to actually get anything built at all and, so and then you have to start going back to kasam and begging him for more time or you have to go back and see if you can ground share which is all pretty muddy yeah so um a ground share with mk dons oh the oh, the oh ground share of oxford city i'm not a very clever person and um so, and I don't tweet very often, but sometimes I get the little sparks of uh, of cleverness that run through me. And uh, this, this did this stadium situation did bring about probably my most commented on and uh, liked tweet ever. And that was my comment when it said, "Have Oxford used Stratfield Break as kind of like a plan to make uh, with an all bells and whistles stadium yeah. to make the triangle look more appealing." Um, it's kind of like if you said to your partner I'm going to go on a stag do to Vegas she would say no no you're not going to do that but then if you say in a few months time okay we're glad to get in together and we're going to Skeggy she might be a bit more appealing to it might be a bit more um, you know <laughs> feel a little let even not feel yeah. quite so bad about letting you do that one so that was my that was my, my one moment of maybe uh, that's how clever I am. I can't even think of the right word. But there you go. It's um, moving on from the stadium and moving on from the behind the scenes stuff. We'll get back on, not really onto the pitch because number seven is <sighs> January transfer window. If we thought the summer was uninspiring, you ain't seen nothing yet, folks. If you want to see... Another situation where Oxford talked about strengthening, getting bodies in, making, you know, getting some competition in key areas and really getting some players in that can propel us up the league. <sighs> Prepare to be underwhelmed. Brandon Fleming came in on loan from Hull. He came in relatively early on the 6th of January. And then we had two, um, we had Stephen Negru who joined on the 1st of January as well. And to be fair to him, he looks quite promising, but was never going to be someone that would uh, be the difference between us getting promoted no. or not. 
So then it came down to Jan to the end of the month. It came down to the last couple of days, as we knew it would. It always just comes down to that mad scramble on transfer deadline day. And Oxford just ended up with two loan signings. Atif Kanate from Nottingham Forest and Tyler Smith from Hull City. We need a striker. We were desperate for a striker. With Baldock being injured and Taylor being out of form, we needed someone to pick up the, sh the slack. And we got Tyler Smith in. That's great. We all went to bed happy. And we all woke up on the next morning looking at our phone saying, why is it saying Matt Taylor's gone to Port Vale? I mean, this, it, nothing else proves that Robinson lost the plot dramatically from from January onwards. Is that decision there. Is it the fact is like, when we are struggling for goals, when there are so many problems in the side, you bring in Tyler Smith and you let Matt Taylor go. So you haven't strengthened the title. You've left it arguably the same at the yep. very best. And, and 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 above that, you've brought in a lad from Nottingham Forest who, who I feel so sorry for. I feel really sorry for Atif Kanate. I hope that next year he gets a loan signing that uh, that actually that he actually gets some benefit out of because this was a waste of time for him. Um, who? never got given a go but was a luxury player in many ways was a guy was a, a forward creative player when it was clear that we needed strength and we needed power in the midfield with the likes of Goran who've gone down injured pretty much for the whole season um and you had players in there who more you had players in there that were just going to be more creative like McGuane, Bate and Brannigan who are good players but they never seemed like they were capable of doing like the defensive holding midfielder donkey work role. But this was this was madness, utter madness. madness, absolutely madness. And things were going badly on the field, and this didn't help. And we'll talk about that now. We'll get back to a section that I like to call Section Eight: Loss, 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 loss. Are you actually went with that title rather than my title was originally oh god oh god please stop it hurting oh god make it stop now <laughs> both good titles <laughs> going back to the previous video we talked after oxford had a game against ipswich town where they beat them in the fog 21st of january we were 10th in the league 35 points eight points off the playoffs coincide that with that stadium um meeting that we had with the county council where it went our way and there was a real positive vibe and feeling around the club and you're thinking is this going to be where oxford united kick on well that very that night that we got that positive result from the city, the county council. Oxford played Wickham away, and very typically, Carl Robinson had no answer to Kara Sainsworth's tactics. You might as well have not played this game and just said to Wickham, "You get all the points," because Oxford turned up and, as predictably, were absolutely useless. Just played into Wickham's hands. Two nil win for the chair boys. But we back that up again with a loss to Burton, and I'll get back to that one in a little bit. But then the loss, and then. The losses just kept on coming, Robert. Loss That's after the loss. We Shrewsbury. played some good sides in that part. We did play some good teams, but there were losses to Shrewsbury. There was a solitary point against MK Dons, which, quite frankly, after the first half, we were lucky to get. Lost to Cambridge. And then and then after that Cambridge game, we were thinking, when is it going to be the end of Carl Robinson? When are they going to make a change? And then that change finally came with a 3-0 defeat at home to Bristol Rovers. But this was <sighs> dreadful. I think the point is, like, before the Wickham match, we were ever more saying things like, well, you know, if we can get four points out of the next two games, or yeah. maybe even six, that's going to give us a real boost to go and maybe make a bit of a playoff push. And then the heart was just ripped out of our season. I mean, if you look at that, Wickham defeat, Burton defeat, Barnsley defeat, Shrewsbury defeat, Mook Dons, thanks God for Carl Joseph, 1-1 one, one draw. Oh, it was Lewis Bate. Oh, Lewis Bate, beg your... Oh, that's it, Lewis Bate, wasn't it? I was thinking of a different goal. Yeah, Lewis yeah. Bates from the edge of the penalty area, which should have probably been saved. Yeah, um, Plymouth defeat, Cambridge defeat, and then finally, one game after he should have been sacked, 
one game and after everyone had just lost complete patience and just listening to him rambling on the radio, picking fights with Nathan Cooper. We'll get into the Carl stuff. You don't have to deliberate on yeah. it. But yes, there, there is a lot of Carl Robinson stuff to go with to talk about in the next section. But this was just talking about the games on the field. Bristol Rovers was just a game where the Oxford fans almost turned up ready to boo, ready to turn on that side, ready to just on the, anything that went against us, we were going to um, start going crazy. And that game was... <sighs> Oxford, was... Oxford had chances at the start, but then it was just sloppy play, sloppy goals, a rash penalty given away... And it was just the it, it was just a game that was done and dusted. You had this horrible 20, 25 minutes where the game was just dead. And Oxford United it was almost just like, just end it now, ref. End it now. We all just want this game to be over. And we want to know what's going to happen moving forward now after this one. But you talked about the Cambridge one. I didn't actually watch the Cambridge game. But I remember that was a game where it almost looked like Carl Robinson had just thrown things at a dartboard and gone like, that's the 11. That was the game where we had Baldock up front. That was the game um, who wasn't fit, clearly. That was a game where we had, um, uh, what's his name? We had Kyle, we had uh, Josh Murphy playing wing back. And we played a side like, and Cambridge, like Oxford, hadn't won for ages hadn't won for more games than we had won for. And we went to Cambridge and we just played absolutely shite. Gave away an early goal and couldn't get back into it. But I also want to highlight Burton away. Because I went to this game. And after the Wickham game, I went to this game in January and I thought, well, you know, Wickham's always the side we do shit against. Maybe we can back this up against Burton. It's not the best ground in the world. It's very small. It, it doesn't look like it really harnesses the best atmosphere or anything like that. Um, but my goodness, this, Oxford just went out and played. Oxford had the feel of like they went out like a preseason friendly in this game. There was no effort. There was no urgency. Like 10 minutes into the game, you just had players like walking to stroll in to get the ball. No tempo. Um, we just literally... And Burton, the bottom of the league, they just brought in four players on loan. They looked absolutely dead and buried on this point. And you'd have thought Oxford just go in there put it back, you know, get into them, get in the lead and we'll win this game. But Oxford was so passive, we invited all the pressure onto Burton and they thoroughly deserved to beat us in that game. And I just remember going away from that one thinking, I think I phoned you at half time and it was like, I was thinking like, this is, this is bad. And then I, I, going back from the game, I just remember I was thinking like, we're, we're in trouble here. Like, you know, I, didn't, I obviously didn't think we we're going to get sucked into a relegation fight, but I just remember thinking, we're in trouble. Because this, was, this wasn't this was just a bad result. This was like players who didn't look like they wanted yeah. to fight and roll their sleeves up and try. And that was... People obviously turned on Carl Robinson in that game. There was a lot of anger. There was a lot of unnecessary stuff about calling him a Scouse or a Scouse C-U-N-T. And obviously then after that, there were people going after his abusing his daughter on Twitter and yeah, stuff it was like that. Yeah, completely out of order. Um, but it just, it, it was, it was just where the apathy spilt over into, ang more into anger for me. That was where it, it, it really just spilt over to the point where, yeah, we really, we aren't going to be able to just muddle through with Carl Robinson. We need to make a change now. We need to freshen things up. <sighs> and finally, they did. And let's talk about the man. Let's talk about big old Carl. Let's go to section nine. Carl Robinson, a descent into madness. I was speechless. I'm like, I'm trying to formulate words here, but it's just like, that is literally what it was. And you listen to him. There was the one on the radio where I am, you know, I am naked, you know, um, before you, you know, you're thinking, what the hell are you talking about, man? Hi, everybody. Hope you're enjoying the video and sorry to take you away from it for a moment. But uh, when you do these videos, you do kind of tend to forget the odd little detail here and there. And I just wanted to touch on something. Now, Robert has just mentioned an interview that Carl did with Radio Oxford after the Cambridge game where he talked about being naked and emotional. I remember it, too, but I can't find I really wanted to try and find the footage of it, but for some reason, Radio Oxford won't let you go back and listen to those past interviews. It's very, very irritating. His interview after that Cambridge game was 
really mad. And I think that's the kind of point of the descent into madness, really, because Carl would say bonkers things after games. For example, that Wiccan Wanderers game where Oxford played absolutely garbage. He came out and said, I think we played quite well. And you're like, what game did you watch, Carl? And it just tended to be a general trickle worse and worse and worse the longer this kind of bad run carried on but um i did want to do like a little dramatic and there, there is stuff written on this by the way i did want to do a little dramatic reading of his interview that's from the oxford mail website after that cambridge game because whew, here we go here we go i know what i can do and i know these players better than anybody said Robinson. Do I think I know what I'm doing to turn this around? Yes. I've been here before with this football club in a worse position than this in the first year. And remember, he talked about that Luton game. The Luton game obviously suddenly became very prominent. In, uh, and it was like, again, what are you talking about? And let's not even start to talk about after this. He went into the whole two captains mode, removing Elliot Moore from the captains. He, oh, I'm getting away from myself here. Robinson added, I know what needs to happen. We know where we've gone wrong and we will make sure that we make it right. Feel free to add your own laugh track in on this. If they make, if they make a decision, that's out of my control. Do I look back on my time here as successful? Yes, 100%. Sold multi-million pound worth of players. Consistent cut run playoff campaigns. This is a bad year in this tenure, and I take responsibility for that. Throughout the course of my career, if I've had one bad year in every four, I don't think I'm too far off. Well, this was a bad year. On the recent run of form and performance this afternoon at Cambridge, Robinson said, we were not good enough. It's as simple as that. A lot of our performances have been too individually based and not collective as a team. The buck stops with me, but there were certain aspects of our game which just looked completely disconnected. We're absolutely fuming about it, and it's not good enough. Today was another of them Today was another of them bad days that we just can't keep having. I don't think we're easy to play against, but we make bad mistakes in certain areas. And he rem and he went on to say that he was convinced that he was still the man to take the club out of League One. But the question, as everyone was saying, which way? But he's picking a fight with um, Nathan Cooper. Nathan Cooper is just a bloke who's our stadium announcer and who works part-time for Oxford United. He's very much a club man. And you're Brilliant. treating him like he's like Jeremy Paxson and Ace Hill trying to trip you up. You know, yeah. it's just what he was doing was asking honest questions. And Nathan Cooper is a man who's been around supporting Oxford United, travelling the length and breadth of the yeah. country far longer than Carl Robinson and will be there, as we know, after Carl Robinson. So very, very... And obviously, a football manager losing, they generally get more um, prickly in yeah. their post-match commentaries. But but Carl Robinson just, oh, just lost the plot in a lot of ways this season, didn't he? He, he, he just went just... from... Like all the way through, just we we we've laid a common theme all the way through of just how things seemed rather like almost lackluster in in, in trying to get players through the door, and then it just seemed like the, the team had no identity. It seemed like he didn't really know what where to play players in the right position. It was always just a little bit of guesswork, no momentum, um, and it just fell off a cliff. I don't think any one of us thought it would fall off a cliff quite as badly as it did and I think many times we spoke and we said we're probably just going to muddle through till the end of the season but my goodness that form I, I don't think I've seen anything like it and it also wasn't the fact like we were unlucky we were getting absolutely spanked every yeah. single week maybe not on the scoreline but no. we weren't playing well we were not so and I think this is all what We've made jokes about Carl's personal life in other videos and stuff like that. And there's all sorts of rumours online, which if you want to go and look them up and read them, go right ahead. Um, but you just feel like saying, this clearly Robinson had issues off the pitch going into this season. And it's clear that um, he had fallings out with several members of our squad. I mean, the fact is, and that's 
you know, and, and that happens. But the fact is that was then starting to have an effect on the performance of the team, undeniably. We said it in the, the previous section, Tyler Smith coming in, well, okay, not the most amazing uh, decision in the world, but we'll take it. No one would have thought Matt Taylor was going. That was never on the cards. And all of a sudden, we're just standing there thinking, what the hell have you done? You've you just... could almost say, Robert, we were standing there naked and emotional. Yeah, that's it. Naked and emotional in front of everyone. That needs to be the subtitle of this video, by the way. <laughs> You'll get extra views for it, definitely. If we get <laughs> if we get a thousand likes, me and Robert will be naked and emotional in the next video. Excuse me while I whip this out. <laughs> On a sub, on a random note, right? This is just completely off topic. Um, what's your favourite Only Fools and Horses episode? Because I've always thought I've always liked the one called Danger UXD. Oh, I like that one. That's a classic. That one there. Isn't there a clip when they're in the flat uh, and something happens? I mean, it might, it might, it might not be playing when this video is on, but it's, it's got nothing to do with this video. It, it just, it just is something that I thought of, and I thought, well, I quite like that episode. It's got nothing to do with. Oxford United at all. I think you've summed that up pretty well with Carl. I mean, again, you were never a huge fan of him, so you probably had a shorter leash in terms of his tolerance for him than me. I remember you would take, you would always text me his post-match comments after the game, almost going like, um, bloody hell, what's he talking about? Um, but some of them really had to be listened to to believe. The, the one where he um, said to Nathan Cooper started Nathan Cooper started to ask question about who was playing right back why is Jovan Anderson not playing right back and Carl Robertson flew off the handle at him about he's not a right back the next game he was playing right back <laughs> I I think in all honesty he, he looking at Carl Robinson in the round in terms of sort of like he did a lot of good things for Oxford United yeah. he did a lot of like I, I, he created several teams at Oxford United that were incredibly entertaining to watch. There were loads of goals and he brought a lot of good memories and happy days for us as supporters. And in terms of sort of almost like pastoral care, when uh, you know, tragedy hit the club and we lost people like Joey Beecham and Mickey Lewis, Carl Robinson's um, approach could not be um, criticised in the slightest. He always handled stuff like that really really well and then when Oxford United fans uh, lost their you know lost their lives he would often go to funerals and sort of represent the club on those little things like that All, always are very things. And again just to jump in the covid stuff he did was great and, and yeah. also as well the, the little things of like there was a lot of time where there was a lot of silence from the club in terms of what's yeah. going on off the pitch and Paul Robinson was always the front man for everything that was happening with the football club he was always um willing to speak on all subjects. I know he likes the sound of his own voice and all that stuff, but he was always that good PR man for the club, talking about every single little aspect that was happening. He seemed to really know everything that was happening at the football club. But the change had to be made, and yeah. the change was made. I don't think anyone could have questioned it at the time. Oxford was 17th at that time when we lost to Bristol Rovers. Five points from the drop zone. And I just want to say on one final thing on it. This won't change anybody's opinion on it, but can you just not... Every time Carl Robinson comes on a media or you see him on TV, can you... Or anything that bad that happens on Oxford United, can you not just blame him for everything? Like, can you just move on from it now? He's not the manager of the club anymore. You don't have to talk about, like, um, as if he was, like, public enemy number one and he's the worst thing that's ever happened to the football club. Because he isn't. And this is a guy, and honestly, I think a lot of it comes back to, in my opinion, it comes back to a guy that maybe was just in charge for too long, got a little bit too comfortable, was a little bit, maybe given a little bit too much power and got a little bit complacent. And then, and all the things that happened off the field with the likes of what Taylor did or didn't do, all that seems to stum back to the, another a player that was maybe too complacent, too happy you know didn't think that anything bad would ever happen to his actions and i got the feeling that there was just a little bit of just um complacency all the way through the oxford united squad this season and i think that to use a carl robinson phrase and i'm not using it as a joke i think in some ways it's a shame 
because I don't think you could question that he cared about this football club. And I don't think that you could question that he cared about being the Oxford United manager because he really did. And in some ways, it's a shame that it ended on such a bad note. I think that says everything about Carl. So what are we going to say about his new replacement then, Mr Manning? Oxford needed a new manager, Robert. We've been a while since we've been in the market for a new boss. Every single name under the sun was given to who was going to be in charge. We've done a video on that, so you can go and check that out. So we don't need to go and talk over too much ground. There were two games that were Craig Short took temporary charge off. And, and you really did see um, improvements in the squad. I mean, again, just to go back to that thing I talked about in the first video about this tenuous link about Brannigan, it was quite a damning interview by Cam Brannigan after that Bristol Rovers game, which pretty much suggested that the players had not weren't really enjoying Carl Robinson being the manager anymore. Um, but so the play, it, it did seem like the side was more refreshed once he'd left, and there were more encouraging performances against Lincoln and against Derby. But ultimately, both games ended in defeat. But then, Oxford finally made the managerial appointment. It was Liam Manning who was formerly the manager of MK Dons. He was manager when they beat us earlier on in the season. He was a manager that nearly got MK Dons promoted last season as well. Came into the role. Um, he had 10 games to save Oxford United. Oxford United were 19th when he took over. Three points a job above the drop zone. Uh, I know we've talked about it in the video, Robert, what we did. But what were your initial thoughts about Manning coming in? I liked the idea of Liam Allen. I thought I looked at him and he seemed like someone who was like the antithesis of Carl Robinson. He was someone who was coming in who was going to be measured, who was going to be controlled, who was probably going to make us a bit more um, tough to beat, and which is all the things we wanted to at the moment. And like I say, his record at Milton Keynes Dons was by and large pretty decent. And then you just feel like, so yeah, I felt like um, he was a good choice and I still think he's a good choice. Yes. Um, I mean, we, we know how it ended, but again, I still was quite encouraged by him coming in. I mean, I, I, I actually was, I've actually been surprised at um, how uh, I thought he would try and make Oxford almost like more attacking and more aggressive. So I was a bit surprised at kind of how what he focused on making Oxford more resolute, which is kind of what you'd expect from a more seasoned campaigner to do if they came in, um, like, for example, a Sam Allardyce kind of figure. Um, but I think that was the biggest thing labelled at him was the fact of, like, would he be the man to to keep Oxford up in a dogfight, in a fight where we're just fighting for our lives and we need to get over the line? Would he be the man to do the job? And, well, before we get into how he actually did it, we did have some games um, where results did start to turn and results did start to go in our favour a little bit more. Not a lot of wins, but more encouraging. Yeah. Got a 1-1 draw against Morecambe in his first game, which really should have been a win. Um, yeah. Morecambe didn't offer much and then got a typical Oxford United concession of a goal in terms of guy on edge of box, guy finds bottom corner, Eastwood can't make diving save. Oxford standing around, scratching their head, saying, why didn't you close him down? Why didn't you close him down? Why didn't you close him down? You know the picture. You've seen our seasons for a while. It's about but, 17 goals like that. Take your pick. But then that carried on with, through difficult fixtures, that did carry on with an encouraging 0-0 draw against Peterborough. First clean sheet for a long time. A 1-1 draw against Sheffield Wednesday. Marcus Brown, wonderful job of winning winning a penalty in that one. Um, and a 0-0 draw against Port Vale, which Ox didn't play well in. But there was enough encouraging signs and we yeah. were getting clean sheets. We weren't scoring goals, but there were signs, shoots of recovery in that little period, Robert. Would you not agree? Oh, yeah. I mean, you could definitely see that the players were trying more, effectively. Try, they, trying more or just looked a little bit more they, med controlled? I sometimes feel more controlled. And maybe there is an element of marginal gains is always a phrase used in sport. It was saying, like, a player giving, like, 2% extra, you know, or something like that can make all the difference, effectively. And sometimes if you're feeling, like, that you're 
can't stand your previous boss and all the rest of it and you're tired of him. Maybe, you know, we're suddenly seeing Oxford United players putting in blocks, charging back, tackling back. Which a couple of weeks ago, you were thinking, well, we, we didn't see that. So this is sort of like stuff that we hadn't seen previously that was suddenly co- starting to come back into the game. There still wasn't an awful lot of creativity there, no. but suddenly it was becoming a lot harder to score against us. It was. And, and I think that was a very encouraging point about Manning early on, is he talked about things that that he saw in the Derby game where Oxford were a little bit too frantic and frenetic with their with with too many players going out to try and charge down a shot meant that there was an open man and the open man would invariably get the ball and have a free shot on goal. And you did see a lot more control from Oxford. You didn't see them like absolutely like panicked once the opposition got near our goal. You you did see a little bit more element of structure in there, which was good to see. Um but the game, you know, the win still didn't come and it started to get really, really worrying, especially when Neil, he'd, he had his first defeat against Bolton, um, a game which was marred by a red card, which wasn't given to Bolton's keeper, but was also a game where Oxford United completely dominated the second half and couldn't score. 1-1 draw against Portsmouth a few days later. Yes, we got a goal in this one. Coming back from a 1-0 down was good. But again, second half completely dominated, could not score then we played Barnsley Barnsley one of the best sides in the league it was always going to be a tough one and they beat us 2-0 and I don't really think it was a game where Oxford United really but Barnsley didn't really break much sweat in order to beat us and so it came down to these final three games of the season and these final three games of the season where we everybody was just kind of hoping that we'd get the job done before these final three games but it didn't but it all turned out all right because section 11 is called survival. <music> 17 games without a win. Jeez. Oh, so bad. And we weren't even in the relegation zone. That's so bad. As There's a third a lot... of the season, yeah. more than a third without a win. Um, and remember in January, I said we were. 21st of January, 35 points. Um, and I think we only picked up one, two, three, four, six points in the game after that. Shocking. Um, but Oxford United did then play Cheltenham Town. And finally, we got a win on the board. Goodrum gets the opening goal, goes off injured. Josh Murphy. This is the Josh Murphy that yep. we've been waiting to see. This is the Josh Murphy. I mean, and let's be honest here. Cheltenham Town were never going to win any awards for their defending in this match. No, but they were. That would always be said that, you know, that can always be something that said we played them at a good time. But we were, we were so devoid of goal. We were so, so down on confidence. We hadn't won for ages. We literally could have played. There were probably a whole host of sides in League Two or the National League we could have played and we wouldn't have beaten so you know, to say it didn't look like it was it was difficult to see Oxford beating anyone at that stage. Yeah, but Matt, but Josh Murphy wins the ball, gets it in, two 0 uh, Marcus Brown, wasn't it? Second Marcus, goal, then, then across the earth again. Go, Joseph got the second one. Marcus uh, Brown got the third and the fourth. Yeah. But they came the second, third, and fourth came like bang, 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 really fast. Um, you certainly gone from being nervy at half time to within about 10 minutes thinking, oh, this is all right, actually. We're in a good place here. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that that's... Um, there, that game was very difficult to watch in the first half because the nerves <laughs> oh, took over and every sort of time Ox got the... It, it was nervous and frustration hidden behind kind of like encouragement for the team. And the same old things was, was happening and the fact that we were creating chances and we couldn't stick them away. Um... And then, obviously, Tyler Goodrum did get that one that almost hit his shin, but ended up going into the bottom corner. But that Murphy cre- work for the second goal, I think that, uh, yes, he pressed high, and yes, he did a lot of work and set up an easy goal for Joseph, but that settled the nerves so much of the Oxford players. And that was more important than anything else, that the crowd just suddenly felt relaxed and the players felt relaxed, and they went out. And finally, you saw the confidence just... Going, coming back into the players minute by minute. But also, credit to Manning for 
because he did a lot of just playing Murphy and playing World Chat, and he gave them plenty of chances yeah, he gave to, them uh, when he first came in, and they didn't really deliver at all. And then he took Murphy, dropped Murphy, and then that seemed to whatever whatever dropped in his head that seemed to work. And he came back sec He came on against Barnsley, and all of a sudden looked cre very creative. Came on against Cheltenham, suddenly looked really good, and then was pretty good in the final two games as well. But 4-0 win against Cheltenham. All of a sudden, it looked like all we needed was a win against Forest Green and the job will be done. And thankfully, if Cheltenham were bad, well, you ain't seen nothing yet because Forest Green were quite frankly useless. Um, and Oxford rolled up to the new lawn on a beautiful early spring day and got a 3-0 win, Robert. A win which ultimately kept us in League One. Oh, was a very weird thing in the sense of like, at one point in that match, we're 3-0 up. Goodrum scored a very good goal. Bodin has scored a lovely goal. Yeah. And none of the Oxford fans are paying the slightest bit of attention to the game because all we're busy doing is looking at our phones going, oh, Christ, what's happening over this game? What's going on over there? And, uh, you know, he's looking at the McDodds being suddenly 4-1 up and then suddenly starting the the um, goal started to go back in against it. And but and it was a good point. At one point, we were 3-0 up and suddenly thinking, this isn't enough. We might need to win the last game of the season to yep. guarantee promotion, uh, not yeah. to guarantee uh, survival. It was really looking like that. And, and it was unbelievable, that MK Dons game. When you think that Barnsley had nothing to play for, they, they, they you know, they, they, they were four-one down. They had nothing to play for. It wasn't like they were completely, compl they were never going to finish lower than where they were. Um, and so it was completely dead rubber. How Milton Keynes Dons balled that up? I will never know because that ultimately cost them. That yeah, ultimately that's sent them down. Um, and, and yes, okay, final game of the season. Maybe Oxford would have approached that game differently, needing a win. We'll never know. But that certainly was the difference between us staying up and going down. But if I'd have showed you this image of Oxford United players celebrating on the pitch at Forest Green, if I'd have shown you that at the start of the season and said, this is what's going to happen at Forest Green, the players are going to be lined up, they're going to be waiting for other results to come in, and then they're going to be cheering, they're going to be celebrating. What would you be thinking? You'd be thinking, oh, we've confirmed promotion. <laughs> or at yeah. least the playoff spot, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've done it. Nowhere was relegation ever on the cards, yes. but I know I know that it isn't a celebration. It's a celebration brought out of relief. Yeah, um, it's, it's still just a celebration. You I still celebrate the fact we haven't got relegated. Yes. I know, I know. I get those things. I just find it quite funny that it's just like um, we're celebrating the fact that we've been shit, and we're celebrating that there were four shit asides with us this season, thankfully. But. So that was it. Manning had done it. Um, we went into that final game with Accrington and um, my, my moods kind of softened on it over the time. It was a very poignant game for this, in terms of reminding everybody of this has been a bad season. You're not going to get anything nice to end the season with. It is going to end with a defeat in very similar style to what you've seen all the way through. Dominant performance somehow conspired to lose it by two goals to one. Um, but it didn't matter. Um, Oxford just had to stay up. Manning had to keep us up. He's done it. And next season, hopefully, we won't be anywhere near this situation. Hopefully, we'll just be bottom and we'll be relegated before uh, we, we need to get into the, the being worried about it, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, this is a guy, MK Don's manager. I mean, what's he going to do for us? There is just a couple more things to go over. Uh, running into section 12, which is... There has been a retained list that's come out. Uh, probably most notable names that won't be there next season are going to be Jovan Anderson and Matt Taylor, who did not get offered or, or may have got offered a new deal, but wasn't something that he agreed on and was has been released. Uh, any any thoughts, early doors on that? Any surprises? On the, um, on the way back to the car, on the... Um after the last game of the season, we were talking about which players we'd like to keep and which, you know, to get rid of. And we, we were sort of thinking with Matty Taylor, thinking, well, maybe we could give him another chance and all the rest of it. But you think a large part of that is just down to sentimentality. Yeah. That we're thinking that, you know what, maybe he will come good. We want him to come good. But you're thinking, actually, he 
didn't play very well last season. And maybe however much of that was like problems with Robinson, I don't know. But it also gets to the fact that he's not actually, maybe he has just reached his peak. Yeah, he didn't have a good season and it was a mistake getting rid of him when we did need goals. But I think that, you, you again, you have to be ruthless in this situation and you, and you, and you constantly have to turn and burn, if you like, and bring players in. There's a lot of players in there that all things being equal, we probably would have liked to have got rid of, but they're on contract, so we can't. The likes of maybe Sam Baldock, um, the likes of Murphy and Wildshut, and um, a few others. Uh, I think Alex Goran's another one who's left. No, no, he's staying, isn't uh, he? They're Alex doing Goran, I think Alex Goran, they sort of said that, um, that he's going to work with the club to see if he can get fitness back. I don't mind it. We'll see how that one goes. I don't mind it. It might just be a case of he does a preseason and goes out somewhere. Yeah. Um, but it's it maybe wasn't as many names as people thought, but a lot of those guys, there were a lot of players under contract, so you're a bit hamstrung with that. But I'm always a little bit more of a softy when it comes to getting rid of players. And I'm always sad to see players leave, and I, I'd quite like some of these I'd have quite liked Jovan Anderson to stay to see how he could have progressed next season I'm always keen yeah. to see how players will improve I think Stuart Finley will be better from a season in League One and I'm hoping that Wildshirt and Murphy will be better having had a year in the club and hopefully with a full pre-season behind them they might be good players I'm in, I'm in I'm intrigued to see how Marcus McGuane improves I'm intrigued, intrigued to see how um, Cameron Brannigan improves under Manning because ultimately I do have confidence above all else that he is a good coach and he will improve the players that we've got which is important because you can't just bring 11 new bodies in No, we can't get rid of you know, a lot of people are doing the unrealistic explanations or just cancel a contract or get rid of them and all the rest of it They're But it's not going to do it we, we, it's going to cost us too much money I mean unless someone wants to come on and buy Josh Murphy from us or something we're going to have to keep the playing with him so I think all we can do now is work with these players and try and get the best out of them between now and next season and there were certainly signs certainly with Josh Murphy that there is a player there who could cause trouble in League One Wiltshire I really hope we can see something after he actually gets fully fit and he can come back after a poor pop free season and let's give him another chance and see what he can do. Sam Baldock even. I mean, I'm still if he can come back and get some stay fit, he will score some goals. It's just a question of like can he do it? Well, that, yeah, I mean, there's going to be those question marks over all those players, aren't there? James Henry's another one, isn't he? He's had his injury problems. What are we going to be able to get out of him? next season um but we will see we will see um i think the only final thing to say uh, just to make it section 13 is what are your early hopes for next season and any final summaries on this season as a whole my early hopes for next season are that what I hope we've done now is that we've had a, a good look and decide of what we actually need, what positions we actually need to get into the club to strengthen us. And like last season where we seem to swap like for like, let's get some actually strength into midfield. Defence is by and large OK. OK. I saw there was like a list that was doing the rounds of like ex Oxford United players who have now been released. People like Ruffles, um, Archer, Ford, Curtis Nelson, people Curtis like that. Curtis Nelson yeah. like that. I mean, I wouldn't, if we could, if the deal was right for Ruffles to come back, maybe. But I really think we should be looking more forward for like bringing new players into the club, bringing in some new players into midfield getting some more strength up, up front and just sort of augment what the players we have here at the moment. And we've shown that we've got a side that can actually be um, competitive, that can actually score goals and do something. It's just what we need now is to iron out, because that last match in the uh, other season, that sure showed that defensive fragility there. That's been there, you know, that sort of those moments where suddenly we switch off and we can see the goal. What we need now is a, a chance for Manning to try and work out there, get some central defensive midfielder in there who can actually shield the defence a little bit more. But you know, try and offer us a little bit more, you know, make us a little, a little bit more tougher to beat. Yeah. I'm hopeful going forward that next season that we will have a better season. But 
again, it depends on who we actually manage to bring in, what our targets are. If we're sitting here maybe in sort of like another eight weeks before the start of the season and we've suddenly got three or four quite exciting new players of us, we're all going to be sitting here buzzing. If we're going to be sat here in eight weeks' time and we've got a few low knees and um, it's by and large we're going to go as again, we're all going to be feeling quite nervous. I don't know. I mean, it depends on who you get in and who you get in early. I don't even mind low knees. As long as they come in early, as long as you yeah. get them in. Sorry, so they can come in and pre-season train. Yeah, so I was just talking over you. But um, our, our low knees last season, Bates and Joseph, can't fold them. Yeah. They're absolutely, uh, you know, they, they did more than we expected them to. I mean, especially Carl Joseph. I mean, for a guy who, where pretty much all season we banged on about how shite our transfer policy was, he's actually done really well. Like, what a great season he had! He, and uh, no one could, and no one could question his appetite, his heart, and his hunger to want to play every minute for Oxford United. We've had plenty of loanies in the past who are just going to be sort of forgettable, sort of like. You almost feel, oh Christ, did they play for us? Yeah. But Carl Joseph, he actually went above and beyond for us. You know, he sort of like he suffered a really bad injury at one stage and was out oh, for yeah. quite a long time, and then he sort of came back in. And at one point, at you know, what is he? He's about nineteen, twenty, something like that. He was leading the line in a relegation yeah. battle in order to keep us up, and was doing it manfully. So yeah. that's not true. And, he's, and, he's, uh, and, he, and he was backed up by Gatlin O'Donka, who was another teenager leading yeah, the line yeah. in a relegation battle. But yeah, that's another encouraging thing to see what young, the young players can do next yeah. season as well. Tyler Goodrum's been a bit of a revelation. It's been great to see O'Donka, who I think looks... I'd actually like to see him go out on loan maybe next season. Um, yeah. league, get League Two football, maybe even National League football. Maybe maybe even go to Oxford City and play yeah, in the National like League get... lead the line for them. And... Um, but maybe, 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 maybe not there. Maybe somewhere where he has to go out of Oxford and you know do something at a club where he's completely. Well, like what familiar. Carl Joseph did to us. Because yeah. Because looking at Swansea and looking at him, I'm thinking there must be a real. You would expect Joseph to have kicked on loads by the time he's come back to um, Swansea, which is sort of what you want from like your youth team players. Now, whether he comes back to us again next season. Who knows? But again, partly feels like saying, let's just see what we can do to try and get things in. You know, we don't. If we could get Carl Joseph on another season long loan, I'll be happy with that. I think it's very unrealistic to think that we're going to be like, oh, we want to win the league. Yeah. Like, I, I, I just feel that like we're going to be more in that line of like finishing in that top six, making a push for the playoffs, but being a more having a more positive side and a more enterprising side and you never know league one is quite similar in terms of the competition and you've lost um if Sheffield Wednesday do go up you've lost kind of two pretty heavy hitters in Sheffield Wednesday and Ipswich um so there is going to be a little bit more competition it, it, you know, things are going to be a little bit more even keeled and I don't even think the standard was that great last season in league one anyway but <sighs> Thankfully, the season's over. Over. Oh, oh, goodness sake. Just went on, didn't it? It was so depressing during that time where we weren't winning a game. It was like, I, I mean, I last two seasons ago, generally couldn't wait to watch Oxford games. No. Yeah. The season, it was just like, I get so, like, I was getting so nervous, like half an hour, 45 minutes, even an yeah. hour before kickoff. And I don't normally get like that. It was really, really... Uh, and again, there's a lot of Oxford... We grew up in a bit of a shitty time watching Oxford. A lot of relegations. Yeah. I haven't been a relegation for Oxford United since 2006. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of Oxford fans that have never actually seen Oxford get relegated. So it's probably not surprising that there's a lot of it's the end of the world narrative around that as well, because a lot of people have never experienced it before. But then again, when you've got a league aside which had the budget to finish in the playoffs, True. which is what oh, we were told, yeah. and we finish it just above the bottom of the relegation zone, it is pretty end of the world E because the fact is we have spectacularly underperformed this season. Yeah. Oh, well, that's an understatement and then more. But, um, and I think that's the overall point, really, isn't it? I think that's it. The, the, there was. From my point of view, as we've talked about, there was just there seemed to be a heck of a lot of complacency and um, 
which has just led to bad decision making, which has just gone through all the way through the season. And thankfully, Liam Manning came into a horrible mess, but was able to tidy that mess up just enough to keep us up. And hopefully it will be a bright, prosperous future for the next few years with him as Oxford United. Fingers crossed. Yeah, but I think that will do it. If you sat through and listened to this, I don't have a medal to give you, but my goodness, thank you very much because there's been a lot of a lot of hot air and bluster, not from you, Robert, but mainly from me. And um, yeah, and, and I can't thank you enough if you have sat through it. And, and anybody that's watched any of the videos or commented this season, then thank you so much. I mean, this channel is something I love to do and enjoying it. And I, if I get one view or a hundred views or a thousand views or whatever subs it's something i just do for fun so it is i, I do appreciate it and i am thankful for all the, the views and, and likes that i get so um that just leaves me to say i'll do some sort of video about something in the next few weeks but other than that <laughs> it'll pretty much be some sort of radio silence until the new season when oh, we all Ian, go again. Stop being so specific you know i'll do some shit don't worry something we turn out <laughs> There'll be some shit to tide you over in the post-season, but there'll be a bit of a break, and then we'll go again for the new season. I couldn't have put it better myself. And um, thank you, Robert, for joining me no on worries. this Voyage of the Damned. And um, have you got any final words for the, the, the viewers out there? It's over. Thank God it's over. Yep. For, this video, for this video and the season. Thanks again. We'll see you soon. <laughs>